Uh, my name is Matt Frisbee, um, and I'm going to be talking about some Angular stuff today. Um, so uh, I realize that this is a um, unified meetup of a lot of different front-end frameworks. You know, uh, there, there's a lot of competitors out there. Um, so I guess the most diplomatic thing that I could start off by saying is that uh, I use Angular, and you should too. Um, so when I was thinking about what to talk about in this talk, um, I thought that I could go in a couple different directions. Because um, there's a lot of things to talk about and a lot of different extensions and things like that. So I kind of decided that I'm going to start a little abstract at first and then kind of rein it in to talk about um, some more concrete aspects of Angular um, and data viz within. So I guess starting off um, at a very high level, um, I, I'd like to talk about some just considerations, some very general things that you should kind of think about when you're kind of putting together some data visualization. So size, shape, and speed, well, what does that mean? So first, some really obvious things. How big is my data set? Um, a lot of the time, it's not really appropriate to be consuming huge chunks of data in the client all at once. So how do we break that apart? How is that going to work? What is the shape? Uh, what the, kind of the topology of the data within? So what is the unified structure of the data I want to look at, and how does it look with it inside? Um, is there a post-processing required on the client? Where should that happen? Um, how does the how does multi-dimensionality of the data affect how I'm going to be displaying it? Um, where is it being served from? How am I getting it? Things like this, and then uh, is it going to be ready when I want it? So if I want to display you know, some abstract data set on the client, can I get it immediately? Can I get it within a single request? How does it look? Does the server need to process it? Things like this. So the second half is considerations of tools that um, you're going to be using or you might consider using. Um, so I guess the first is the pipeline organization. So bottom to top, what is this data visualization going to look like? So we're not just in talking about what's only happening on the client, what's happening on the server to make this data visualization possible. Um, and that goes from top to bottom. Where are the bottlenecks going to happen? Things like that. Um, delegation of responsibility. Where, where and what tools am I going to be using to make this the most efficient uh, data visualization possible. And then finally, uh, optimization, um, and this is especially true in Angular. Uh, you get a lot of stuff for free, but that doesn't mean you should always use it, um, especially when you're trying to do things at scale. Um, and there's uh, a lot of plugins, but if you don't use them correctly, you're not really going to be helping yourself much. So I wanted to start off with kind of a, a use case um, uh, that I experienced at DoorDash. And uh, this was a relatively simplistic data visualization that we were doing. Um, it was really just kind of a, a multi-dimensional table that we wanted to kind of like slice data and analyze in different ways. And so um, we built this a, a couple different ways um, and learned some interesting things while we were doing it. So um, basically, the kind of the idea was that um, we had all this data in Postgres, we wanted to present um, aggregates of it and categorize it and do different dimensions um, for how many deliveries we had done in a single day. And uh, we wanted to do this for the entire history of the company and we wanted to display it all at once. And DoorDash is now very large, and um, there's a lot of data that goes into that. So yeah, so we just really wanted to create uh, a, a relatively simplistic table like this, and then we want to like so here's like the multi-dimensionality. So there's a bunch of cities in a region, and then a bunch of regions on a given day, and then we want to do aggregates like this. So relatively simple problem, but doing this over hundreds of thousands of different deliveries, this is uh, uh, difficult to do efficiently. So how do we want to attack it? So the um, oh yeah, that's good. So the naive way of doing it is, okay, well, let's just dump everything on the client and have the client figure it out. That, of course, is not going to work. That sucked. Um, really slow. Angular's not good at it. Re just really messy. Not a good way of doing it. Incredibly slow. Not a good way at all. Um, so the next thing, um, we delegate. Uh, okay, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> So uh, we delegated um, to the Django ORM uh, to uh, grouping the data and kind of doing the aggregates and stuff like that on um, the denormalization. Um, and that was uh, a better, but we were still dealing with like Nginx timeouts and things like that. And you could change delivery methods, but um, it was still problematic on the front end because um, uh, splitting it apart, a lot of things, a, a lot of dealing with a huge, huge processing time in the back end was a big problem for us. So finally, what we ended up doing was we handcrafted a SQL query that was, you know, a lot of group by statements and things like that, all the aggregation and things like that. On a synchronous worker, stored that value, 
and then that ended up being almost instantaneous. So we just ran, ran that a bunch of times a day, even though it's a really slow query. Then you can just dump the data on the client and let the client do what it does best, which of course is process the data and display it. So um, yeah, so this is kind of the, the, when I say 10x, I mean that this is the delegation of responsibility when you're dealing with data like this. So this is, this is kind of the um, obfuscated kind of query that ended up, we have, this is relatively the same structure that we ended up using. This takes all the data, puts it together, and then we could just dump it into the table and let the client deal with it how we want it to. So, all right, so now let, let's get more into the concrete side of data visualization. So, okay, do you want to do some data viz? All right, so Angular is good at a lot of things. Um, NG Animate, I think, is awesome. I love using it all the time. It's um, really efficient. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it's very powerful. Um, there's a lot of great tools out of the box in the framework that lets you um, kind of move stuff around and manipulate things efficiently um, and uh, access data as well. And then the community is great. You know, Angular is always improving and changing all the time, although I used to debate that with the upcoming uh, 2.0 shift. Um, but of course, uh, there's also a lot of bad, and this is what I'm going to talk about a lot here. So watch this float is going to kick your butt um, if, you, if, you, if you don't true uh, with respect. And this is what most people are encountering when they say, I'm doing something big with Angular, and it's really slow. They're hitting the watch list. Uh, the model view view model concept, uh, template control, data binding, um, sometimes these things feel weird when you're trying to do data viz, um, and that's with a good reason because it's not really what Angular is designed to do, I guess you could say. There's a lot of things that Angular is good at, you know, uh, every, everything involving forms especially, um, a lot of good things, but in terms of dealing with huge data sets, um, Angular, it's, it, starts, it starts to feel a little clunky, uh, as I'm sure anyone who's used uh, anything with Angular at all at scale, ng repeat sucks in a lot of ways. Um, and then of course, um, if you're ma manipulating from usually within a directive, the DOM, um, you're limited to jQuery and jQuery um, unless you've added something else to the mix. So not a lot of things that you like to work with. And so uh, as I mentioned, watch lists are especially bad. So um, Angular's model-driven views with the bi-directional data binding, um, huge data sets. Um, require that you're really careful about where you're putting your watchers and things like that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, you really kind of need to know what's going on with how you're setting up your binding, um, and that's sometimes that's not as easy as you think. Um, I'll talk a little, more, a little bit more about uh, that later. Um, and especially, um, uh, not only the number of watchers, which is what a lot of people are concerned with, but also the density. And when I say density, I mean that two entries in an Angular watch list are not always alike. So if you set up some huge callback to watch a, a single model attribute, uh, or excuse me, model property, um, that's obviously gonna take way more time than like 50 interpolations in a template. And then uh, finally on the side, the 1.3 release introduced lazy binding. This is nice, um, but it doesn't really solve a, a lot of things, including on the example I'm gonna show you in a second. Um, so it does fix some things, and there are some third party libraries that do kind of take away this um, scaled data binding problem, but uh, it's not a fix all. So, <clears throat> little audience participation, here we go. So, looking at an app like this, hopefully a lot of people here are familiar enough with Angular that they can sort of decode this. Who, by show of hands, thinks this is going to crash? And who thinks it's not going to crash? Who has an opinion at all? Okay, all right. <laughs> This will crash, and the reason is, of course, which is that the scope.watch function, by default, is a reference watcher, and every object literal that's churned out by this is going to return a different object. The references will collide, and this is going to run infinitely and will crash the program. So little things like this, knowing about what's actually going on with a certain scope watcher, are why you have to be so careful at scale, because things like that, well, not this, ex this exact example, but knowing what's actually going on with the watcher is really important when you're doing this thousands of times. So you can actually count the watchers in your program. This is a, a little thing that I put together uh, based on uh, a lot of different pieces, but you can actually walk the down tree and actually inspect how many watchers you've got in your program. This is really useful um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but, and, but you can kind of see that um, it's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very important to know where your application is going to be ballooning with scope watchers. So um, let's kind of start talking about D3 more concretely now. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people here know what D3 is. Um, this is kind of how I think about it. Um, it's kind of the library that most effectively pairs data with the DOM. That's, uh, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me at least. 
Um, and when you're first learning it, it kind of smells like jQuery in a lot of ways, and that's, uh, that, that's by design because jQuery does a lot of things correctly. Um, but this is really kind of a missing piece that integrates into Angular, um, which is kind of piping uh, for aggregate data into what's actually going on in the DOM. So what does it do better than Angular? Obviously DOM manipulation in a lot of different ways. Um, it's also completely abstract from the DOM, so you're not you know, paired with you know, actual you know, elements or SVG or anything like that. You can do whatever you want, CSS, anything like that. Um, it can perform these manipulations um, very efficiently. And then uh, obviously organization, coercion, and pipelining, all of these things that um, Angular kind of lacks utilities for doing, this integrates really nicely with Angular. And um, so generally, um, you'll uh, find it inside directives, which of course is where you should be having the vast majority of your DOM manipulation anyway. <coughs> so uh, I put together an example application. Let's pull this up. So uh, I threw this together um, pretty quickly. So um, there's a, a lot of things going. It's kind of a Frankenstein application. But basically, um, there's a couple things I'm trying to demonstrate here. So obviously, this is all being done in Angular. Um, there's some D3 mixed in, but some is also being done natively with Angular. So what this is, is I've taken um, the, uh, the Bitstamp API, um, and they have a, a, a nice WebSocket interface, and as well as the blockchain.io. So here we can see this is the real-time um, ask and bids on Bitstamp being updated. And then uh, these are all Bitcoin transactions going on right now, paired with their addresses. And then uh, this here is just a kind of a graph of what's going on here. But you can see the additions and uh, subtractions in real time. And then these are the payloads that are, well, these are the, I kind of changed them a little bit. But these are the payloads that are coming in um, from Bitstamp. So um, I wanted to bring your attention, that probably one of the most important things on this screen uh, is that uh, this top line right here. So every single entry here, um, if you're uh, familiar with Angular templating, any, any single expression that is in the template um, that AngularJS has to use dollar parse on uh, registers a watcher. And so every single one of these, as shown here, this is actually, um, this is uh, that um, watch calculator, on time. Uh, that watch calculator I showed before um, is actually being used to examine one of these. Sorry, I might cover it up. It's, uh, it's looking at one of these, it's, it sees three per, because obviously there's three pieces of data, and then it's counting um, each year. So we're seeing uh, 9,000 watch list entries just for these two columns alone. And the reason that uh, I, I kind of went with that number is because um, JSPerf, um, when kind of benchmarking Angular, um, uses about 10,000 uh, watchers to kind of see uh, how it performs. So that's kind of um, 10,000 watchers to kind of see how it performs um, with this many. And the reason that this is actually looking so good is because, um, yes, there's a lot of watchers, but as I mentioned before, the density is very important because every single one of these the watch entry can be evaluated like that because it's a simple string comparison. There's, no, there's nothing going on. However, if you do a ton of scope.watch, scope.watch group, scope.watch collection, all these different watchers that are going to register huge callbacks um, that are defined within the scope or within the directive or whatever, then you're going to actually see performance problems. And this is often where it comes down. But when you, even though you have a ton of watch entries, 9,000 here, and it's uh, oscillating, um, you can see that this is still quite performant. And then this is. Um, Right, and then so the other thing is that, uh, right, so this is all being done with Angular. All these animations here, this, 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 this is all being done with ng-animate. Very performant, love ng-animate. And then these two are obviously being done with D3. So we've kind of got a sliding scale representing um, a moving average. Oh, I went out of the way. So a moving, uh, the red line is the moving average, and then the black line is the um, new entries to the asks and bits. Excuse me. So, um, the, and this is, uh, as I mentioned before, the best way to use D3 in Angular is within directives. And so these are their own directives and all of the D3 manipulations are happening within those directives. Um, and uh, it's, a, I, it's, a, it's a, it integrates so well with AngularJS, there's almost no reason to not use it. Um, I acknowledge that this is a little bit of a simplistic demonstration of D3, but it kind of demonstrates that um, you can kind of cram a ton of scope watchers in an application and still have kind of a nice fluid animation going on with D3. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about this. Anyway, so yeah, so this is, um, yeah, so ton of scope watchers, application still works. Show, back to the slideshow. <clears throat> right, so outside of this, um, there are, as I mentioned, optimization is a huge part of being able to do data visualization in the client. Um, a lot of things you shouldn't take for granted, like the difference in performance between for reach and a for loop for an array, um, these can be substantial at scale. So there's a lot of things that you aren't able to take advantage of um, that might be nice. So for example, 
it's really nice to write an application that has a ton of scope watchers and you have all these callbacks that are you know changing data automatically, but if you're, you know, your application is slow, it's no good. So there are points that where even optimization to the highest level, if you're using everything correctly, you're still gonna run into performance problems. So there's a couple extra pieces that you can incorporate. Um, so if you're using templating or slow, you can integrate React GS, <coughs> excuse me, React JS. React JS actually, I've only worked with it a little bit, but it integrates really nicely with Angular, um, and it gives you a, a lot right out of the box. The virtual DOM is, uh, the virtual DOM diffing is terrific. Um, the data binding takes a little um, getting used to, um, and then uh, they, uh, they manifest in Angular as directives. But um, this is awesome when you're dealing with really slow templating. Uh, and in the example I showed you before, where we've got 9,000 watch entries, mostly a result of templating, React.js can kind of cut down a lot on that. So that's really good when you're integrating with Angular. Um, and if even that doesn't work, um, you want to take a step further, you can always give Dart a shot, which um, a lot of people react to strangely, but uh, Dart is actually really interesting. Um, and uh, I didn't really know this until recently, but uh, Dart, um, if you run it in Chromium, it actually has its own VM, so you can run um, Dart code without cross compiling it to JavaScript. And so if you're really going for like ultra high performance, you actually might want to consider Dart because um, it, it does offer you a lot of things that JavaScript does not, typing, nice things like that. So uh, in general, um, this is kind of uh, just a, a, was a really quick overview of kind of some of the considerations um, with uh, scaled uh, data visualization. Um, it's uh, Angular is. I, I love Angular and it's great for a lot of things, but sometimes, as you can see, it does need a little bit of help in terms of modifying the DOM and other concerns. Um, but uh, that's uh, the, yeah. anyway. So this that was kind of an overview. So um, kind of wrapping up, um, as uh, Brian mentioned, uh, I write a book. Uh, you should buy it. Uh, it's really good. Um, and uh, so it's it's really it's it's uh, extremely modern. Um, it's up to date with the the latest framework. I I, I know that one dot four release is coming soon. But um, that's really worth checking out. It's available as a um, uh, as an ebook as well. So <coughs> to wrap up, I have a copy of it here. And because you guys were so eager to participate before, I'll give you a second chance. So uh, <coughs> I have an example for you here. So we have a relatively simple application here. So the first person. I can tell me how many watchers this registers and just shout it out. Don't do one, two, three, four, five. <coughs> Gets my book. So go and just call out. Five. No. One. <laughs> one? No. Six. Six. Ten thousand earlier, right? Uh, ten thousand was for I. That that was a, <laughs> that was a huge thing. So somewhere in between, probably. Ten. Zero. Uh, it is more than zero. Three. <laughs> 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 it is. It is. Oh, it's more. Ten. More than ten. More than sixteen. More than sixteen. Forty. Less than forty. Thirty. It's more than thirty. Thirty-five. It's less than thirty-five. Thirty-three. Thirty-one. 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 You said thirty-one. Okay. Thanks, guys.